This is Wapo. He sustains himself on a surprisingly healthy diet of ships, garbage, and even people for that sweet hit of protein. And in a manner best described as somehow, Wapo found his way into becoming the main antagonist of the Drum Island arc, much to controversial reception. So Wapo is a difficult character because I both love and hate him. And today you, the audience, are going to act as my fictional pirate psychologist to explore my wapo based issues, because we are on a mission to rank every major antagonist in the most comprehensive and exhaustive way possible video by video, this time featuring the hungry, hungry hippo himself, Tin Plate Wapple. So something I love to do in this series is analyze the very first panel that a villain appears in, because they're often very carefully crafted to give us a striking and unique first impression. But Wapple's first panel is incredibly unremarkable compared to almost every other villain, and I actually think that's a great way to sum Wapple up. You just see a dude gorging himself with an ornate knife, and you only realize how ornate the knife is in the panel where he finishes eating it, which establishes Wapple as a villain of great consumption. He has a devil fruit that will allow him to eat anything. And in fact, it requires him to consistently keep eating. He cannot stop. And it's a not so subtle metaphor of wealthy kings consuming their nations for their own personal benefit. Just in this case, that consumption is very literal. For example, when Wapo returns to Drum Island, we have this gem of a speech. Hear me, my people. Everything in this country is my candy and I prefer my houses cooked well done. So it seems like a bit of a tired concept now. But Drum Island is the first arc that takes place within an actual kingdom and Wapol is the very first king we meet. And I know these days everything's in a kingdom with a king, but this was our initial venture into the topic and Oda had a lot to say. She's not heavily featured in the drum arc, but a lot of Wapol is designed to contrast Princess Vivi as well as eventually King Cobra of Alabaster. Because this is our introduction to kings, Wapol is supposed to show us the exact opposite of what royalty should be, so that during Alabaster, Nefertari Vivi can step up to show show us how a true leader acts, which we do get a couple of tastes of during Drum, notably when Vivi calls Luffy a failure as a captain and begs Dalton for help. What we see here is a princess on her hands and knees, ready and willing to part with all dignity to some common man guy or for the sake of her people. Whereas Warpol, even at the last second when it was clear that he was going to be beaten by Luffy, couldn't even humble himself to offer Luffy a position higher than quote, vice king. And then another taste comes with the reverie flashback where Wapol slaps child Vivi and she very maturely and diplomatically apologizes to Wapol for something that she didn't do. And something I've always found interesting is that Vivi and Wapol essentially did the same thing. Their nation suffered a crisis and so they left, with the key contrast between them being why they left. Vivi fled in order to hunt down the identity of the person causing Alabaster's problems and to seek help for the sake of her people. Whereas Wapol immediately fled and left his people as sacrifices to ensure his own personal safety. And after hearing about this, Vivi is enraged on a scale that even Crocodile struggled to get her to. Because Crocodile, he's an evil bad villain dude. Of course he's going to do evil bad villain things, but Wapo, mate, he is a king. And on Alabaster at least, being a king means protecting your people above all else. But Wapo isn't just a false king in spirit, it's also quite literal. Because when he fled the island, he immediately rejected the title of king and took on the title of pirate captain. And then when he returned to Drum, there is this sickening scene where Wapo Paul declares that he is no longer a pirate and he is a king once again. He has an inability to take accountability for anything, such as when Dalton recounted Wapol expelling the nation's doctors and he just replies, couldn't be helped, that's politics, as if he, the king who makes all of the decisions, had no choice in the matter. And so Wapol is only a king when it suits him. And then as soon as it actually comes to performing kingly duties, well, all of a sudden he is a pirate. King Cobra of Alabaster once said some very poignant words, which were, never forget, a country is its people, which hits as hard as it does, partially because Wapol demonstrates the exact opposite philosophy, where a country is its king. And that doesn't work because Drum is falling apart. But that's the thing with Wapol though. A lot of his character is meant to be the foundation of the Alabaster arc, which I think is a great credit to Oda's planning, but Alabaster is not this arc. And I think this may contribute to why Wapol feels a bit underwhelming during his own tenure as an antagonist. This is pretty common with early One Piece villains, but we also don't have a lot to work with in terms of motivation and backstory. By all accounts, Wapol's father was an absolute boss of a king who oversaw the great medical society of Drum and was even able to command Dalton's loyalty. But we never get to see what happened to turn Wapol into the exact opposite. We're told it's because he was spoiled as a child, but I don't know, to me, that doesn't really cut it. At least not compared to the depth that we'd go into with future villains and even some of the past ones. What I would have loved is even a one-page flashback to show the difference in parts between Vivi and Wapol, because they were both raised by ideal kings and yet they could not have turned out 
as more opposite rulers themselves. And another key role that Wapol exists for is to facilitate Chopper's story. Drum Island used to be known as the great medical land with the most advanced and skilled of doctors in all of the Grand Line. And we do see an example of this because the Ishii 20 are able to heal Wapol even after Dalton decapitates him. So these doctors are genuine miracle workers and Wapol robbed this country of those miracles. And so enter Dr. Hiraluk, one of the only two physicians remaining on drum not under Wapol's control and someone who medically is completely powerless to do anything of substance. In fact, he often makes things worse, but he is determined to return miracles to Drum Island. Again, medically, he's worse than useless, but Hiraluk was trying to find a cure for people's hearts, a sickness directly inflicted by Wapol's rule. And really, Wapol's plan for Drum Island is horrifying. The idea of restricting the supply of doctors available in order to push up the prices of consultations, procedures, and medicines. So squeezing people in order to enhance his own personal wealth. And there is admittedly a sickening logic to the numbers, and Wapol definitely treated his country more like a business designed to extract maximum profit, which is a skill that would actually be expanded on in Wapol's later One Piece appearances. Here's one of my Wapol problems though. During Drum Island, he's very much meant to be the Spandam to Chopper's Robin, a nexus of tragedy. But while I perfectly understand Spandam, I do question Wapol. Because for one, I don't think the Wapol going after Hiraluk makes a lot of sense from any perspective. Because Wapol's most defining characteristics are this bizarre sadism and insatiable greed and or gluttony. So look, option one, you want to be as much of a sadistic prick as you can. Great, all for it. But in that case, you would leave Hiraluk alone because he's actually doing more damage to the people of Drum than he is good. So Wapol should consider him like an entertaining jester. Or option number two, you are super greedy, cool, also on board with it. And now what you do, right, is you leave Hiraluk alone to emphasize how much you need to pay for Wapol care. Because if you don't, then you are going to be treated non-consensually by a quack doctor who is very likely to end up killing you. I mean, I get the quote logic. Wapol wants Hiraluk executed because he's a criminal with all of his doctoring and such. But like so many things about Wapol, it is such weak reasoning. And you could say that, yeah, Wapol's just dumb, but he's not really. He comes up with brilliantly evil ideas whenever money is involved. And even if he was just dumb, that's very rarely a satisfying excuse in storytelling. It feels like a poorly built bridge. Where we come from and where we get to, very important, with Hiraluk inspiring Dalton in the issue 20, but it was a very flimsy bridge that we had to cross to get there. And I personally feel like Wapol targets Hiraluk simply because of story. The fact that we need to connect him emotionally to Chopper and thus to Luffy. And I really don't think it's Oda's finest work in that regard. And in the end, Wapol's not even responsible for Hiraluk's death. He was already going to die twice over by disease and mushroom. So it's hard to even claim that Wapol had a huge effect on Chopper's backstory because the tragedy was going to happen either way. And personally, I feel like Wapol very much lacks the agency of a main antagonist and is very much banking on incidental tragedy happening around him. And I guess one argument you could make is that Wapol exists to explore the idea of monsters because the two major drum figures are Chopper and Dalton, both of which are literal animals and monster people due to their devil fruits. But in the end, they're both far more human than Wapol, who is the real monster. I feel like that's kind of weak as well though. And I don't really know how much I buy that. But even so, let's accept it. There's still a problem in that while Chopper is such a huge part of this arc, he and Wapol spend almost no time on screen together. Our major protagonist and our major antagonist are almost like completely separate entities. So it's really hard to solidify that emotional oomph between them. And really the person who Wapol spends the most time on screen with is actually Luffy. Because Luffy fights Wapol three times. That is as many rounds as Crocodile got. To be fair, Wapol does provide a similar contrast with Luffy that he does to Vivi. Wapol is a man who goes out of his way to harm those around him even, and especially if it's not in his best interest. Like when the avalanche was approaching and he refused to allow any of the doctors who just saved his life to get on Robson and then potentially left them all to die buried in the snow. And then against that, we have Luffy, who was prepared to die to save Nami and Sanji, going through one of the most painful experiences in the series of climbing the drum Rocky's bare hand and barefoot, all to save his quote, friends. But really the greatest challenge that Wapo gives Luffy is on the philosophy of flags, which led to the most iconic panel of Drum Island and one of the most iconic in all of One Piece, where Luffy states that Hiraluk's Jolly Roger is unbreakable. And while a phenomenal moment for Luffy, I will say that it doesn't really do anything for Wapol, except make him look even more underwhelming because he doesn't even have the villainous power to destroy a single flag. To me, this is the moment that the fight was over and everything that comes after it is kind of shown in formality. Because Wapol isn't a villain capable of challenging Luffy either ideologically or philosophically. And I think to be a truly successful One Piece villain, you need to do at least one of those, well, ideally both. But Wapol can't challenge Luffy's ideas 
ideology because he doesn't have an ideology, which isn't something that you can accuse many, if any other One Piece villains of. Even the ones I criticize most do have internal ideological consistency. For example, in Orange Town, Buggy, he was a very flat villain, but he was there to embody the idea of treasure, and he was incredibly consistent with that. If we move to Baratier, we have Don Creek, who is also less than a fan favorite, but he was very consistent with the idea of firepower versus willpower. And then you've got Hody Jones, who may be the most disliked villain in all of One Piece, and yet he was still so consistent with being a specter of hatred. And that consistency is what I feel like Wapol's missing. He doesn't have a solid purpose like almost every other One Piece villain does. He's designed to counter the ideology of a series of characters, but it doesn't fall under the umbrella of his own. And so what Oda does is stretch Wapol across three different ideas that don't really blend well together. Challenging Vivi about what it means to be a leader, then maybe he's challenging Chopper on what it is to be a monster, and kind of, but not really challenging Luffy on what it is to be a pirate. Wapol dips his fingers into all of these pies, and so you get a little taste of each pie, but not a satisfying meal. Which I guess is actually kind of fitting for a character who can never be satisfied by eating, but it also doesn't satisfy me reading his run as a villain. With Wapol, I genuinely don't understand why he does 50% of the things he does. Because half the time, he's not just screwing other people over, he is directly harming himself with his decision making. And again, he's not dumb. I mean, he is sometimes, sometimes he's real dumb, but sometimes he's real not dumb. It's inconsistent. And the conclusion I come to for why this is, is simply because Wapol wasn't a fully baked antagonist. The strongest thing he does is the idea of royalty by contrasting Vivi, but she's barely in the drum arc. So this leaves Wapol floundering and very much just being bad for the sake of being bad. So every time I reread or rewatch the Drum Island arc, I'm very aware that what I'm watching is an over the top caricature. Wapol is evil because we need someone to beat up. And I should note that this isn't just my impression as a man on the internet. Probably the biggest black mark against Wapol's competence as an antagonist is when the One Piece franchise itself admitted that he simply was not good enough. And it did this with One Piece Movie 9, episode of Chopper Plus, which if you're unfamiliar, that was an era of One Piece where original movies were getting a bit stale. So they started remaking old arcs and packaging them as films that you actually had to go and pay to see in a cinema. And so for one of them, they chose to remake the Drum Island arc, which is set in an alternate universe where the crew lands there after Water 7. So Frankie and Robin are sort of in the movie. They don't do a lot, but they are there. But the production staff had a big problem to solve, which is that Wapol is not the kind of antagonist who can helm a movie. And their response to this was to more or less replace Wapol with his non-canon older brother, Mashudu. And what Mashudu represents is the potential that Wapol never quite reached. Mashudu is every bit as cruel and as entitled as Wapol, but his actions actually make sense with his motivation. Meanwhile, Wapol spends most of the movie completely empty headed and doing whatever Mashudu tells him to do. Although the film does try to explain this because at the climax, Wapol does eat Mashudu and retake the mantle of antagonist just in time for Luffy to finish him off. And it's explained in a sort of, ah, this was my Wapol plan all along. But by that point, it's too late because he is seconds away from being dismissed. And here's the craziest part about this movie. In the end, it's explained that this was all Chopper's dream. He wakes up on the Thousand Sunny and returns to fictional reality. But just let that idea sink in. Even in World, Chopper sees Wapol as such a limited threat that his imagination had to conjure a scarier and more competent older brother to take his place. And I just don't think that you would dare do this with any other series antagonist. I should say any other series primary antagonist. Even the ones I'm most critical towards, like Captain Kuro. If for whatever reason they ever made a Syrup Village movie, there is a 0% chance that they would replace Kuro with his scarier older brother. So Wapol is a failure of villainy that I'm not sure has ever happened before or since in One Piece. However, thankfully, Wapol does have one saving grace and it's a big one, being his post-antagonist character arc, where he goes on a riches to rags to riches again journey of starting his own toy business after eating garbage and accidentally revolutionizing the world by creating a new metal alloy to the point where he becomes extraordinarily wealthy and even Frankie Shogun is built out of this Wapo metal, which I love because Wapol's character undergoes his own personal industrial revolution. And so he goes from a depiction of consumerism under a monarchy to a depiction of consumerism under a capitalist society. Because Wapol is now, without question, the most successful businessman in One Piece, having made enough money to just flat out buy his own kingdom. And even though he's changed a lot less than some may like, I do at least have a level of respect for him now. On Drum Island, he inherited a kingdom from his father and ran it into the ground with his horrible decision making. However, Wapol has now managed to build a new kingdom from the ground up, and yeah, it took a little bit of luck, but Wapol put in the work and made himself worthy of the title of king for the very first time. He also went on to marry Miss Universe and almost lived happily ever after, before he, of all 
people saw Emu in the Five Elders' true forms and is now one of the most wanted men on the planet. After Drum Island is where I think Oda really figured out who this character is and how he works best. Which is not as a serious antagonist who does genuinely horrible things, but instead as a side character with questionable motives, but very high comic value, that you do actually start to root for and get excited to see again. In any other shonen, Wapol, he would be a throwaway villain who we'd never see again. And it's a huge credit to Oda that he managed to spin Wapol into this strangely lovable side character. But unfortunately, side characters are not really what this video series is all about. Looking back on it, I feel like I've spent a lot of this video speaking about characters who aren't Wapol. Examining Vivi, Chopper, Hiroluk, Luffy, and even Dalton, when I really should be talking about Wapol. But there's really not a lot to say because there's just not a lot there. Wapol is one of the premier examples of a podium villain in One Piece. During Drum Island, he exists purely to elevate other characters, and when Olympians receive their gold medals, no one really wants to know the story of the podium or even consciously remembers that a podium ever existed. That's Wapol. As a villain, he accomplishes some things, but he scores low marks in almost every area imaginable, except for his post-character arc. And he doesn't even have the foxy excuse of claiming that this is just a pure comic relief villain, because even though Wapol is a joke a lot of the time, he does cause serious harm and we are supposed to take him seriously because he is the main antagonist of not just any story arc, but a straw hat centric story arc. And I really do feel like Wapol is our first and perhaps only example of an E tier villain. Because as much as I love Wapol dearly, it's for everything he did after Drum. Because what he did on Drum Island amounted to so little that they had to practically replace him with an entirely new villain in the movie remake. But you let me know in the comments which villain you'd like to see ranked next.